Hello, Sandra. Thank you. My greetings to all. I'm very happy to be here sharing this and to be presenting this new space, uh, The Future Is Now, believe it or not. I'm going to share my desk because later on, I'm going to, we are going to have some practice. There are two issues that are very, well, often we receive questions about uh, whether IPv6 is encrypted or not. And the other one is, has to do with privacy, a very fashionable topic. So let's start. Is IPv6 uh, encoded, so encrypted? I'm going to ask my colleague, Marcio, to please, during the presentation, Marcio. Okay, we have this poll. Do you think IPv6 is encrypted? Yes or no? What do you think? The host and the panelists cannot vote. 15 seconds more. So let's see what people think about it. And while you answer, do you have uh, any ideas? If, if you have any ideas of uh, things that you would like to discuss at these webinars, please say so. So, Marcio, is it possible for me to see the results or at the end? Well, here you have them. 43 people, 43% actually, uh, of the people be do believe that it is encrypted and 51% say that it is not. And 6% say that they have no answers about it. So, before answering now, let's see whether after the presentation, you can answer it yourself. So I always like to start with some history. When you wonder whether it's encrypted or not, well, the idea is that I, when IPv6 will uh, transport um, a packet, um, it does it using IPsec. Let me tell you about the history of IPsec as such. In the RFC 1825 through uh, RFC 1829, they define the structure of uh, IPsec on IPv4 and IP, IPsec in general terms. So all these RFCs were grouped um, and they were superseded by RFC 2401 and 2412. And here you have some titles of the RFC 1826 is called standards track and uh, this uh, 1827 is called uh, IP encapsulating security payload. And then this one is called IP authentication using keyed MD5 among others. So basically what does IP, IPsec do as such? Here I underlined it. IPsec can be used to protect one or more paths between uh, different uh, hosts or between a pair of security gateways or between a security gateway and a host. That's basically what IPsec does. So is it true or not? Should I believe it or not? Um, and it's important to discuss this because many, many people often say, oh, IP6 is encrypted, I'm safer because I have IPv6, etc." cetera. So I wanted to highlight what the story goes, uh, how the story goes, because in order to understand the present, it's all, always good to know what the past was. So there's RFC 4294 
said uh, the IPv6 node requirements. This is a document that was published in April 2006. So, and it has a paragraph that's called security protocols. And we see that, um, I'm sure that many of you may have seen this um, uh, in your devices and it's ESP. Uh, encapsulated security payload and RFC 4303 and the AH that is authenticated header that says if you see the word must be supported this must in capital letters this this has to do with the way the uh, documents are written or drafted and this is the key this is the key to all must be supported where in the IPv6 node requirements. So look at the key where it is. Um, um, so once again, okay, this is uh, 8.2. It says that it must only be supported, but it never says that the node at the time of sending the packet to a destination needs to be encrypted. Nowhere is that written. It's not a command. So, now, having said that, I want to point out that very explicitly, and this is a more recent RFC 188504, dated January 2019, that word must was, that was, to, uh, was changed to should. So it's less strict. Now it's looser, more flexible. So um, so that's optional. So IPv6 is not encrypted by default. So to that end, I'll show a very brief uh, demo. In the demo, this is what we have. This is PC is the second part of the demo. This is fracture two. I'm going to do something that is very simple. A telnet of router two to router one. And why telnet? Because this is a client protocol. It is connected and these are the devices. I'm going to open the Wireshark here, the sniffer to capture the packets. And then I'm going to execute a simple telnet over IPv6 from router number two to router number one. The password I enter the password, it's IPv6 day. I enter, I click enter and let's see the Wireshark. We're going to filter with a Telnet protocol and let's see what happened. This is IPv6 and see the Telnet protocol. And let's see what happens. I hope you can see the screen properly. Let's look at this packet. User access verification. Now, if I now go to Telnet, look at this here. This is what router one sent to router two. This is origin and destination. Let's see, we could take the password here. This is the letter D, that's the data. And then here we have the I and the A and B6. That's the password that was written in order to connect from router two to router one. 
so this should be stated explicitly in the sense that it is not ciphered. Now, I'm going to make another presentation before we go to the questions part. We already watched this demo. Now let us look at another interesting topic, which has to do with IPv6. And if IPv6 respects privacy, and when we speak about privacy, I'm speaking about traceability. This is doing follow-up of a user. So, This was just the beginning, but the issue of privacy and in the framework of the internet is something that has been gaining more and more attention. People are worried about this more and more. So I'm going to deal with this topic with you, traceability. Let us remember in the original Slack, and this was quite interesting, And Henry and the friends from Unicamp, we discussed about this issue and how some, somehow how some of the devices get connected. So originally, in the alter configuration of IPv6, well, this is done by Slack, stateless alter configuration. This document here. This RFC is from 1998. It was based on a mechanism called EUI 6.4. According to EUI 64, I'm not going to go into every single detail, but we do have a MAC address up here that we all know. The first 24 bits, uh, the ones here, the first ones, the second 24 bits are defined by the vendor. We apply an algorithm it embeds in the middle of the two 24 bits group, the FF and FE, which have to do with the interface identifier. So we have to recall this part here. So if we apply this algorithm, we receive this one down here, 2001 DB8, A, B, and all the rest. These are 64 bits. In other words, this is the EUI address, the complete IP six address based on EUI 64. 64 bits are the root interface identifier. Now, if the addresses I'm going to use to browse the internet are going to be the ones of the MAC address, the last 64 bits of the network will always be the same whichever network I'm in, whether at the office or a public Wi-Fi or the university Wi-Fi. So the last 64 bits will always be the same. Now let's see what happened. Today, this is no longer the case. In 2007, an RFC was created, 64941. And now we have this document, RFC 8981, which introduces a mechanism that is different from the previous one. I'm going to explain this. Now, what are the differences in the 4941? You can reuse the interface identifiers. The last 64 bits are at random in, in general terms. I'm not going to go into the details. So you can reuse the interface identifiers and these were of a fixed period of time. So if you connected to a site, you could know how many interface identifiers were going to change. So some kind of traceability of that person could be made and the lifetimes of those were up to seven days. Now this document 8981 of February this year, it was already voted and published. Here we see the IIDs, they're not reusable. The last 64 bits are going to be at random. 
and more frequently. The renewal time is also at random. There is, of course, a period of time in which this is renewed. And the lifetime of the address was reduced to two days instead of seven days. These are the differences we have between RFC 4941 and RFC 8981, which is very new. Having said that, that I'm going to ask Marcio, maybe can you make the poll on the question on traceability? So you have the question, the second question, does IPv6 improve end user privacy? Yes, no, don't know, or doesn't answer. 30 seconds. So let's view the result. I think I gave too many clues already. Anyway, the right answer is yes. The IPv6 improves end user privacy. Let us now make a final demo with the topology I had. Here, this is router two. which is connected to Ubuntu 21.04. Basically what we see here, this is the router that is announcing RA packets through this interface. And this Ubuntu 21.04 is being auto-configured. This is what I'm going to show you here. So this is what happens. If we tell Ubuntu, show me the interfaces, this is what we will have here. We have two IPv6 addresses, global addresses through the link local. We enter the, if we look at the IPv6 address, it's based on the prefix. But what I want you to look at is at the temporary the global temporary and dynamic address. If we look at the ending here, the last 64 bits, if I disconnect from one network and I connect once again to another site, whatever happens, this address will be created constantly. And this will be maintained for a longer period of time. For example, 19C, I'm going to disconnect from this network. I disconnected the cable. So it was C19C, and now I'm going to reconnect with this address, which has now changed. It's not C19C as we had previously, but it has now changed quite a lot. It's a temporary tentative dynamic address. And the other one, which was a stable address. And I don't want to go into the details, but this address, although I disconnected and connected, is remained as what we call a stable address. So this is what I had to share with you for the time being. When my computer, when I'm browsing in my computer, this will be done with the global temporary address that we have here. This is the address that it's going to use. 
so it will be far more difficult if someone from outside checking the records and the logs will be able to follow me. So let me see if there are any questions in the chat before giving the floor to the next speaker. Are there any questions on the topic of privacy or encryption? We can have two minutes for that. So while we wait to see if there are any questions, I want to show you something else. The computer will be transmitting when accessing a website with the 38E. Now, let's look at the router. And if we tell the device show users, you have the IP address 308P, which corresponds to the temporary address when this router wished to establish the communication with this device, he corrects himself, the device with the router it used the dynamic IP address. So let's see if there are any questions. Hi, Alejandro, is there some way to force traceability of the devices? Well, this is what I was explaining just now. For example, there are OSs such as Linux and you can tell them not to manage temporary IP addresses. And undoubtedly, we're all aware the issue of the cookies and all that. Now, apart from that, work done by the IETF in different groups as a working group. The issue of privacy, user privacy is very important. Four, two, turn off. And uh, like in the case of Linux, you can change those flags. So the devices will behave differently. Well, so thank you for the questions. 